Dr. Steger, thank you very much for having me uh, here because it is, as you can imagine, a great honor and a great pleasure to be able to stand here in front of you and talk about my new book. So I'm really very honored. I studied scandals at the University of Tokyo for 10 years. Don't do that, that was not the best idea. <laughs> Regarding the conservative nature of Bodai. But I pushed through and I somehow survived. And throughout the time I wrote uh, three case studies on Japanese scandal, namely the drug scandal of Sakai Noriko, the, uh, the political scandal of Ozawa Ichiro, and the corporate scandal of the Olympus Corporation and the role of Michael Woodford in it. And later I added two more case studies, namely the Olympic logo scandal of Sanoke Jiro from 2015, and the latest contribution is uh, the Johnny's scandal. I just wrote a case study on uh, Johnny's and Johnny Kitagawa, so if you are interested you may uh, want to check it out. But my point is that today's talk would be some sort of a theoretical output from all those case studies. Now before I start actually talking about Japanese scandal, do you have uh, an idea how a typical Japanese scandal looks like? <coughs> Just like that. <laughs> so you can imagine what kind of craziness is going on when there is a scandal, right? It's pretty much like this. The transgressing elites assume their ritualized role. They repeat a fixed set of phrases and words. They shed a tear or two. Tears are now lacrimation, very important in Japanese scandals. And they bow in a shower of camera flashes. But what's behind this theater or spectacle, if you want? This will be my today's task to sort of make you understand the nature of scandal in contemporary Japan. First of all, I don't want to bother you with uh, scandal definitions and media scandal definitions, but we need to go through at least one definition, namely, what are the conditions for a scandal to emerge in Japan? So we have a transgression, in other words, violation of norms. And this transgression must be Disclosed, first of all, by a whistleblower, informer, insider, somebody in the know. Second, the transgression must be attributed to at least one elite individual. Commoners don't count. So there must be one elite individual from political, corporate, cultural spheres who uh, is sort of designated as the villain. Third, uh, the transgression must be framed by the media. So there is something called media framing. And Scandal media very often apply a guilt frame, rendering the transgressor as a villain. Next, the transgression must be denounced by the public. In other words, the moral indignation of the public uh, can create a pressure on the establishment. And finally, every transgression is somehow sanctioned by the authorities, uh, either symbolic or material sanctions, such as detention and fines, or symbolic sanctions, such as loss of face, position, status. Obviously, the symbolic level is more devastating than the material. So this would be a short definition of scandal. Now, what I'm going to do today is to present you my advanced theoretical framework for studying Japanese scandals. And I'm talking in my book about chapters 4 and 5. Chapter 4 is Japanese scandal as social ritual. That's the first approach. Or today that will be the second approach I will take. Uh, secondly, we can approach scandal as a media product. It's a product of media routines, journalistic rituals, practices, and so on. So in the first part of today's uh, class, not class, I'm sorry, I'm not confused <laughs> by my students. Uh, in this talk, I will present scandal as media product in the first part, and in the second part, I will turn a little bit more anthropological, and I will talk about media scandal as a social ritual. <coughs> so, first part, Japanese scandal as media product. If you want to talk about Japanese scandals as media products, 
We need to realize what's going on in the background. What are the power relations? And I argue that there are a couple of, not power actors, but important actors in every scandal. They include political, bureaucratic, and business circles. In other words, the iron triangle of power, say, comes right. Then we have prosecutors, we have advertisers, we have talent agencies, we have anti-social forces, or Yakuza, that's media euphemism for Yakuza. Uh, and we have, of course, the public and the mass media. Now, uh, as you can see, the prosecutors belong to the bureaucratic circles, and they uh, usually, in scandal, either criminalize or minimalize transgressions. Then we have agencies, talent agencies, advertising agencies, and they try to sort of protect their clients from the scandal. So they try to suppress the leak. Then we have uh, the anti-social forces that very often collude with the power triangle. And we have support groups, those people who, are, who will loyally support their celebrity or politician, no matter the scandal. And on the contrary, we have the civic groups, the NGOs and so on, who actually protest against uh, the transgression. Unfortunately, the civic groups are relatively weak in terms of changing the nature of scandal in Japan, but there are some cases where the civic groups play an important role. And more, most importantly, the media here are divided into the inside media and the outside media. As you can see, the inside media are located in the within the power triangle. So they are basically, instead of sort of monitoring the triangle, they are sort of working as a PR for the triangle. Well, it's the outside media who attack the, 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 the establishment in case of transgression. And I argued in my book that scandal in Japan is a composite product of the interaction among these power actors. Now let's, let's take a look at the difference between the inside and outside media because that's essential for understanding how Japanese scandals are being produced. The inside media, that's the media oligopoly of major news companies, so the dailies, TV networks, blog newspapers and news agencies. Importantly, the inside media are members of Japanese Newspaper Association or Nihon Shinbun Kyokai. And that means that the inside media journalists must follow the rules of the so-called Reporters Club, or Kishakurabu. And Kishakurabu, or Reporters Club system, organizes access between news media and sources, but these journalists, they practice self-censorship, very often, Jishuku, and they avoid investigative journalism. The big dailies, they avoid investigative. And my argumentation here, here would be that scandals are usually kept private by the inside media in Japan, primarily. It is the outside media who become the triggers, who trigger the scandal. And the outside media, that's basically the media periphery in Japan. Weeklies, monthlies, photo tabloids, sports papers, local papers, foreign media, importantly, and online communities, and many independent journals. These people are not members of the Nihon Shinbun Kyokai, which is why they do not need to follow the Kishakurabu rules. They are, their hands are not tied. So, the weeklies are the main instigators of scandal in Japan, Shukanshi. Now, we have two types of weeklies or Shukanshi. We have one type, which is uh, the weeklies owned by uh, the newspapers, such as e, Asaki Shukan or Sunday Mainichi. That's Mainichi Shimbun, and uh, the Shimbun has Sunday Mainichi. But, importantly for our context, uh, there are weeklies owned by large publishing houses, many, such as Bungei Shunju and Shinchosha. And those weeklies are pretty much the biggest uh, you know, instigators of scandal, namely Shukan Bunshun and Shukan Shincho. Those are the main two weeklies. And, of course, I argue that scandals are usually triggered by the inside media, while the in, uh, by the outside media, while the inside media keep silent, see no evil, usually. Now, when I look at scandal production, I can see five actors or five groups of actors that all uh, co-create the scandal. First is the so-called promoters, those people who actually promote some uh, occurrence as newsworthy. 
inside as netizens and whistleblowers. Second, there are assemblers. These are the newsmen, the media people, editors, networks. And these people transform the newsworthy occurrence into a media event. That's the thing we then see on the television. Third, we have the performers. And those are the actual transgressors who dramatize scandal by televised confessions. And I will, in the second part of this talk, I will, I will focus solely on the performance. Fourth, we have the influencers, not like online influencers, but people who can somehow influence the way scandal is treated and judged. And these are prosecutors, agencies, and pundits. They either criminalize or minimize transgression, depending on the on the on the country. And finally, we have the receivers. Those are the audiences, the readers, viewers who actually decode and interpret the media text, and they send uh, a feedback to the promoters uh, in a in a form of moral indignation. The public is angry, so this is when the promoters can feel that scandal works. But more importantly, for today's context. I divide Japanese scandal into three stages. The first stage would be leak processing. This, that means that the journalists are receiving leaks and uh, information from the whistleblowers. The second stage is scandal proper. That's pretty much what we see on the television and what we read in the big dailies. That's when the scandal really starts um, becoming a huge thing. Before that it was sort of invisible. And finally we have climax and final. And that's basically the final press conference, usually apologetic, and I will focus again very closely on this part in, my, in the second part of this speech. Now, leak processing, that's the first stage. What happens? That's the latency stage. Namely, the transgression is an open secret to a select few, but it is not yet in the public domain. So, in other words, we talk about whistleblowing. The whistleblower, an insider revealing and information about some hidden secret in public or private sphere, in Japan usually contacts first tabloid journalists, then Japanese whistleblowers contact the prosecutors, and then maybe police. But they don't usually contact the big dailies because they refuse to publish scandals. And the most typical whistleblowers in Japanese scandals, including corporate scandals, are company insiders, corporate auditors, subcontractors, anonymous reporters, and witnesses or victims of corruption. These are the usual whistleblowers. And in my book, I argue that scandals are never born and always given. What does it mean? It's a socially constructed phenomenon. I, when I was studying scandals in the beginning, I thought, well, it's a spontaneous thing. There's a transgression that pops up, sort of, and people start to sort of react to it. But as a matter of fact, these scandals are always motivated by something. It's not a spontaneous act. And I claim that the primary motivation for leaking a scoop in Japan uh, comes from the so-called three C's. Cash, conspiracy, and capital. Or con confession. Cash, that means that the disclosure is uh, financially motivated. Usually, uh, the investigator or the reporters can get up to $1,000 in, in Japanese, in, in, in American dollar, for one leak, for one scoop. So you can imagine how many people are actually financially motivated to release a scandal because of cash. Journalists can either sell a tip or they can write under a pen name and release uh, the Kiji, the article, in some way. Second, it's the conspiracy. That means that the disclosure is politically motivated. Mm -hmm. In here, we can say that scandal is a composite product of secretive plots by political enemies. For example, the opposition attacks uh, the government based on some leak, leaked from the weekly. And finally, we have a confession. And confession, that's the case where discovery is morally oriented, uh, motivated. It's really an, a more or less unforced confession to the media based on one's own moral reflection. So I would argue that these are the three basic motivations to leak uh, scoop. Here you can see the same thing. This is the private sphere. This is the public sphere. The transgression leaks uh, 
based on either cash or conspiracy or confession. The coincidence is not really the case. And only then can the leak become a proper media scandal in the public sphere. Now, we are still talking about the first stage, leak processing. Uh, the social media became really important these days when uncovering scandals in Japan. The Japanese netizens, or netomi, are leaking scandals to the public while setting the agenda for the mainstream media. So the mainstream media can actually check the online communities and they can pick up scandals from there. And the, these Japanese netizens, or if you want, online detectives, were especially effective so far in uncovering plagiarism in Japan and in uncovering data fabrication. For example, the scandal of Haruko Obokata from 2014 that was leaked by the online people, the online detectives who were comparing the two theses of Obokata and they found out that there is some place which is copied. Or the scandal of Sano Kenjiro 2015, the Olympic logo, it is a scandal. Uh, also here, the netizens, the online communities, <coughs> started comparing the Olympic logos and they found out that Sanokin Giro's logo, Olympic logo, is a joke. It's a copy of a copy of a copy sort. So that was also released by the Netherlands. And there are many other small scandals, such as the CV fraud of Sean Kay, if you are aware of Sean Kay, and that was also uncovered by the uh, uh, online communities. And these communities usually flame some debate online, netto enjo, or enjo jiki, <coughs> They flame the debate, really the, 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 the debate uh, is in flames. And uh, the netizens use built in wars, such as Nietzsche, weblogs, such as NetGeek, video platforms, such as Nico Nico Doga, and finally e journals, such as BuzzFeed. Now we are entering the second stage. This is scandal proper. That means that the inside media, who are the most decisive actors here, they finally proceed to cover some scoop that was previously released by some weekly or by some foreign media. And the leak info becomes a full-blown scandal. The inside media, they drop their see-no-evil approach and they turn into sort of public avengers, really torturing the transgressor, shaming him or her. Uh, you can imagine, you maybe even can imagine. And I argue that there are four main impulses for the inside media to actually start covering a scandal. Otherwise, the inside media don't want to really uncover scandals. They don't want to much talk about sensitive issues, especially the political ones. But when there is an official investigation, then the media has to sort of catch up. Because the legal proceedings are on display, there are raids being made, arrests being made. This is when a proper scandal can emerge. Second, tabloid pressure. That's the case when the weeklies expose and magnify some transgression uh, so much that the uh, inside media, the dailies, simply cannot ignore that anymore and they start sort of releasing the information. The third uh, impulse for covering a scandal is the foreign pressure. That's really important. That means that in there is some international investigation and that is exposed by the foreign media. And that's a case where the Japanese authorities or Japanese establishment cannot but react. Because when once it becomes uh, an international issue, then the inside media start covering the scandal. By the way, this is also the case of the Janice scandal. I don't know if you follow the Janice scandal of Johnny Kitagawa, the sex abuse scandal of the biggest talent agency. That too was. Uh, kept si uh, the inside media were silent for more than half a century. In 60 years maybe they ignored Kitagawa's sexual abuse. And it was only this year when the BBC stepped in. And that's when the scandal became a real scandal. If BBC wouldn't have stepped in, there would be no uh, Japanese scandal. Because the frame pressure was too much for the authorities to ignore. And finally, we can talk about public backlash as uh, an impulse to start covering a scandal. And that's the case where the public, for example, goes into the streets because of some scandal, because of a mild treatment of some transgressor, because of the prosecutor's work being doubted. And that's when the moral integration reaches the top or goes beyond the levels of normality 
and it becomes a public protest, then the inside media finally uh, cover the scandal as well. The TV broadcast uh, starts once after the scandal appeared in the dailies. So that's when the TV coverage catches on, adding millions and millions of uh, viewers. Usually the format where, the, where Japanese scandals are discussed and gossip is the white shows or wider show. And they're, they're, these shows are monopolizing attention through crime, gossip, and scandal. And importantly, the inside media are careful not to offend the talent agencies, or Jimusho, and the advertising agencies, Densu, because the Jimusho and Densu are pretty much untouchable in Japan. And the main focus of the live TV is uh, in on the tearful press conferences. I will discuss that in a second part. The celebrities being taken into custody and out of custody. That's always when the cameras must be there. And finally, when there are police raids, prosecutorial or police raids, raids. Those police raids are actually anticipated by the media who get a contact from the police friends. Now, finally, we reach the climax and fight fade out stage where. Uh, there are damages being assessed and there are sanctions being imposed. Now, scandals are being treated on two levels at the same time. The first is the legal level, where transmissions become, uh, are based on failing one's uh, legal responsibility, or hotekisekin, and it results in material sanctions, detention, fines, suspended sentence, and so on. And this level is executed directly by the state through the court. And here, the next level is the symbolic level, and that's when transgressions are related to moral responsibilities, or dogi tekisekini. And these lead to symbolic sanctions, such as also face, position, status, which is, by the way, the worst thing that can happen to you in Japan, and uh, executed by the community through the shaming process. The transgressor is shamed publicly, and I will talk about it in a minute. The, top, the, the final moment of, the, of scandal is usually the apologetic press conference or Shazai Kaiken. That's when millions of people are watching on television the crime, celebrities and politicians. And media, the, me, the inside media who are already in the game, they cover the performance of confession in a surgical detail. It's a, it seems to be a fetishism of the media to cover each and every detail. How is the transgressor bowing? How is he or she crying? Why is he blushing? And so on. And these, or, these are basically orchestrated pseudo events. To me, they are not, they are not real media events. They are pseudo events, as Daniel Borstein would say, uh, with high degree of spectacularity and ritual. And these Shazai Kaiken, they have huge uh, ratings in Japan. One would think that these things are not that important that people don't watch them. But as a matter of fact, between 40 and 50% of viewing audiences are actually glued on the screen when the scandal is happening. Although the majority of my friends say scandals are boring, we cannot watch them. But still, somehow the Japanese cannot help but watch them. And finally, scandals enter collective memory through books, documentaries, and films. Uh, all my case studies in this book uh, had at least one film, one book, and one documentary. So you can see that. And this is basically the, the, uh, the uh, one more look at the process from a different perspective. So you see you have the transgression leak. That leaks usually through the weekly, local papers, sports papers, foreign media, online media, independent journalists. In other words, the outside media. The outside media start exposing the transgression, but in the meantime, the support groups, the power triangle, and the agencies are trying to cover up the transgression, hide it from the public as much as they can. The civic groups, independent lawyers and NGOs, they are, on the contrary, protesting about transgression. And finally, the prosecutors, the police, the committees, in other words, the influencers, they criminalize or minimize transgression depending on the relationship between the prosecutor and the transgressor. And only when the daily press, the inside media, are pushed, basically pushed, to publish a scandal, 
Then the daily press, NHK, commercial TVs, they catch on and they mass mediate the transgression. And it becomes this huge thing, which I showed you uh, on my first slide. So you can imagine. Okay, this was a Japanese scandal as media program. Now let me move to a more anthropological level where I will be discussing Japanese scandal as a social ritual. This is basically my main argumentation in my book that Japanese scandals are social, heavily mediated social rituals that manifest and manage transgressions throughout Japanese history. Okay, social ritual. Where did my uh, theoretical inspiration come from? First of all, uh, the, Dur the Durkheimian sociology. So I look at transgression that are approached from within the sacred profane system uh, which of ideas that maintain societies as civil religion. And I will be more interested in Japanese sh civil religion or Shiminshuke. Then I was influenced by Victor Turner, obviously, because as you can see the word ritual is uh, in my title even. So, Victor Turner discussed the so-called social dramas as uh, narratively structured episodes with some ritualized qualities, and these social dramas both manifest and manage conflicts. And finally, my last theoretical inspiration came from cultural sociology. This is maybe where my approach um, is overlapping with anthropology, but I was more into cultural sociology, which uses anthropological ideas a lot. So here, uh, Jeffrey Alexander, the father of cultural sociology, would say that scandals are social performances that are located between ritual and strategy. Now we will take a look at the ritual and strategy part. But before I even start talking about Japanese scandals as social rituals, I have to uh, remind you, of, you know, I need to remind you that Japan is a uh, ritual-sensitive culture. So, social rituals actually throughout the history form the foundation of the distinctiveness of Japanese society as such. John Haley or Lucien Pai have documented as well. Uh, rituals maintain social order in Japan and preserve, not transform, preserve the status quo. Uh, so you, Yoshiro Sugimoto would go even further and he would claim that Japanese are uh, that there is something called adherence to algorithms. Uh, the usual Japanese person needs to feel um, safe uh, with the process he or she's going to undergo, so that's why the Japanese love scripts, patterns, sequences, manuals, and that is all of course ritualized, which is also the case of Japanese group life. If you know, uh, I think you know the Japanese group life is heavily uh, ritualized, so you have to behave when you enter, the group, you have to somehow behave when you are within the group, and then you can, you again have to do some ritual when you leave the group. And Talcott Parsons even touched up on Japan, and he said that in Japan, social obligations are direct ritual obligations. And my argument would be that modern Japanese rituals reflect moral conventions of the pre-modern civil religion, or Shinichukyo. Once again, Victor Turner. Victor Turner would uh, discuss social dramas. And I argue that social drama and media scandal actually follow the same uh, processual logic. So you have a social drama, the traditional pre modern social drama. You have a breach of norms, you have a breach of norms, you have a crisis, extension of crisis, redressive mechanism, and finally reintegration. And when you look at scandals, you realize that. It's pretty much the same. Scandal is triggered by a revealed transgression, the breach of norm. The breach leads into a crisis that cannot be simply sealed off. Punitive actions are brought into operation, symbolic, legal, as I said earlier. <coughs> and finally, the transgressor is shamed and interrogated, but he or she is eventually reintegrated back to the system. And this is um, the main uh, idea. I uh, distinguish between three stages of scandal as ritual, namely confession, exclusion, and reintegration. And I will now focus on these three stages more closely. 
So confession, here it's important that the willingness to confess, or confession per se, and admission of guilt is critical for Japanese justice. So uh, Japanese justice is following something which is called the restorative justice, or shufuku tekisegi. What does it mean? It means that there is a huge psychological stress inflicted on the transgressor. The transgressor is isolated from the society. The transgressor is being subjected to lengthy interrogation. And that all is for the sake of a full, ideally tearful confession. So obviously, some parts of the Japanese justice system can be applied um, on scandals as well. There are three confessional strategies in Japanese scandal. The apologetic strategy, or shazai no senryaku, is typical for celebrity scandals, and that's where the transgressor <coughs> fully confesses and admits responsibility in tears. The second uh, confessional strategy is the defensive strategy, or uh, <coughs> mamori no senryaku. Mamori no senryaku. Where here, uh, one claims innocence, denies accusations, scapegoat secretaries, and sort of avoids responsibility, which is typical for the political scandals. And finally, we have something that's called offensive strategy, seme no senyaku, and that's where the transgressor actually counterattacks the accusation, fills libels, and sues publishers. And this specific strategy is typical for heavyweight, experienced politicians who are not afraid, power holders, uh, such as Johnny Kitagawa, for example, he was, a, he was a great power holder, that's why he always offended the, uh, the person who accused him. And foreigners, which will be the case of Michael Woodford, he, uh, who in the Olympus scandal actually applied the offensive strategy. He attacked, he counter-attacked the establishment, the Olympus had, and he won the case. So that would be... Uh, the first would be the apologetic strategy. Now, I looked at what words and phrases the transgressors usually use when explaining their scandals to the public, and I found out that they apologize sincerely for failing responsibility, second must always be uttered, causing disturbance, distrust, worry, inconvenience, to whom? To clients, affiliates, uh, citizens, fans, investors, or simply to everybody offended. And uh, some uh, transgressors go even further, and they voice their duty to do further investigations. They want to prevent the recurrence of the conflict. They want to indicate their gratefulness for learning a lesson in a hegemonic manner. And they ask for cooperation and support from the authorities and the police. So this would be a typical um, apologetic script. Of course it differs, but this is the, the basic core of every Japanese apology or shazai kaiken. Now how, the, how does it look like when Ozawa Ichiro steps in and claims innocence uh, via televised vindication or keppaku kaiken? The point is that the transgressor here, politicians usually, they try to transform their scandal into an affair where accusations can be reversed and everything could be confused. And what are the typical words and phrases the Japanese politicians use in defense strategy? Well, they did not know about the transgression, they do not remember, they cannot comprehend, they cannot make any detailed comment, they render the allegations as a misunderstanding, they find it unnecessary to respond, and they left the matter up to their secretaries. <laughs> So this would be the defensive strategy. And the offensive strategy, as I said, lies in counter-attacking the accusation, attacking prosecutors. Ozawa Ichiro was always attacking prosecutors for being corrupted. That's how he wanted to reverse the accusation. Suing publishers, filling libels. And this is issue used only by those, by those who are really infuriated by strong feelings of injustice and they stop caring about the Japanese ritual code. This was the case of Michael Woodford, who comes at the Act Olympus. Then, uh, by those who wield unshakable power and influence, such as Johnny Kitagawa, before his death, who always counter-attacked the magazine when some magazine wrote some bad things about him, he systematically uh, vehemently counter-attacked the application. And finally, the offensive strategy can be uh, used by those who lose temper during their confession and start attacking 
in you know emotional outbursts, uh, the journalists, which was the case of Nonomurari Mutaro. I don't know if you've heard about the Nonomurari Mutaro scandal, the most infamous scandal in Japanese history, where Nonomurari Mutaro started banging his fists on the desk, crying, crying like a little baby, and screaming, screaming. So this was. Uh, a failure, by the way, and, but it was um, a form of offensive strategy. Now, so far I was talking about words being used, but in any ritual, it is both the voice and the body of the transgressor which becomes closely observed. And this is, I argue, also the case of the Japanese scandals, where the obsession with proper appearances runs deep, as you know. You know, one has to have proper appearances. And that's why the media, when they judge the confessional performances, they overfocus on appearance, on appearances. So the media discuss the mental and physical states of the transgressor, such as blood cremation, sweating, blushing. Then they look at the standardized auxiliary criteria, such as hair color, makeup style, dress code. This all is analyzed closely by the Japanese media during the confessions. Right? And they look at the non-verbal expressions, such as glances, gestures, postures, and most importantly, vows. So you know that the bow, OGD, indicates the degree of deference. That's why it's used in scandals to show that deference. Um, according to some sort of scandal manual, an ideal bow should be at least 19 degrees deep and last at least 30 seconds. But when PM Abed was apologizing for his uh, communism scandal, he was bowing his head for eight seconds, which is a very long time, so it was special and specific. That's how he communicated that he's really sorry. But look at Taguchi Junnosuke, the famous celebrity from the Kattun band. He actually went even further, which is okay in Japanese scandals. It doesn't happen that often, but maybe the transgressor goes into Dogeza when the, you know, accusation is really serious. So Taguchi Junosuke went into Dogeza, he was like this, in front of the police station, doing Dogeza. And that lasted 16 seconds. He stayed like this for 16 seconds. Do you have an idea what, what, what did he do back? He had a joint with a friend. So the, the message is don't do uh, weed in Japan because you may end up doing Dogeza for 16 seconds. Now, the public shaming is something that is difficult to talk about, but we have to bring um, out. Uh, the role of shaming, or the threat of shaming, is integral to Japanese moral discourse. Of course, we uh, must be careful with uh, Ruth Benedict and her Hajino Bunka, uh, but we can follow Leo Leonardsen, who is a crime scholar in Japan, and he labeled Japan as a shame-based consensus culture. So, the threat of shaming, even, not shaming per se, but the threat of shaming, oh, I don't want to be shamed in public, that itself contributes to social maintenance in Japan. And John Braithway to even say that more shame and more scandal means more empathy and less stigma. So the shaming process is essential. The transgressors are shamed. And, of course, they usually draw, uh, shed a tear or two. Some of them cry like a long time, some of them shed 22 tears, such as Sakai Noriko. And the point is that the breakdown of one's physical control over one's body is a scandal decorum that has to be. That's what you need to show that you are being hurt so that the, the offended side can see some observable, observable evidence of your suffering. So that's why and this comes also from the Japanese justice system, but apologizing in tears actually reduces the punishment. This is the restorative injustice. And that is the case of, scandal, uh, of scandals in Japan. To illustrate the obsession with tears in Japanese scandals, I want to mention the case of Sakai Noriko, one of my case studies in my book. Sakai Noriko was uh, caused taking drugs with uh, her husband and she was given a suspended sentence, and when she was doing her own confession, 10 minutes long scripted ritual, then uh, 
she dropped 22 tears rolling down her cheeks. Imagine there must be journalists actually who are assigned to count the tears or count the bows and the death and so on. You see, this, this is important to realize how the, the appearance, mitame, and the, you know, everything becomes, the, the performance becomes so closely observed. And by the way, Sakai Noriko did shed 22 teardrops, but she was attacked for being not authentic. And that was only because she used the waterproof makeup before starting to cry, before she started crying. So the tears were just too perfect for the media. They wanted to see some, you know, a human there. But they got perfect 22 large tears. And that was a topic of discussion for a long time. So here I want you to understand how important tears are in Japanese can. Now, the Japanese media, when they look at the transgressor confessing, the ritual of confession, they compile those performance diagrams even. This is from the weeklies. So you can actually check how well was the transgressor, again, Sakai Norika, by the way, doing. And uh, this is uh, constituted by variables such as the gravity of scandal, chicken or kisa, the truthfulness of confession, shinjitsusa, the impact of the press conference, and again, very importantly, Ojidino Fukasa, the depth of one vows. That's, so she was quite good, but then she didn't do well here, and that's how scandal transgressors are being scrutinized by the media. But that's, that happens only when the scandal is out there. Before that, the big media do like nothing is happening. So this was confession. I was talking about confessional. Now let me move to the second stage uh, of the scandal ritual, which is exclusion. Now, if you recall Shinto, Shintoism, there is a movement where uh, one becomes impure, or kegare, and then there is a necessity of the sacred, or hare, to purify itself, or misogi. And here I would say that there is a, an affinity with Japanese civil religion where originally the ritual of exclusion is realized through village ostracism or murahashibi. Uh, here, in modern scandals, the transgressors are, first of all, separated from the sacred realm. So we have sacred profane, they are separated from the sacred realm, naibo uchi, the inside, the safe, and they are moved to the profane realm of reality, She's called Kegare, but we can also call it Gaibu or Soto, Uchi Soto, you know the. So, and the bridge is so the bridge is the media scandal. These people, when they are moved to the profane realm, they are in the media represented in terms of difference from us. So the media, Japanese media love to say vare vare, latashtachi, thereby indicating that we are not like the person and the person is out. And the transgressor is, is excluded to the outside of their professional platform. This is called social exile. So the transgressor is sent to a social exile. The celebrities, they are excluded from their talent agencies, or uh, jimusho. They enter a period of social exile. They have to get rid of, they get, have, must be lost. They must be a, away from the limelight. They must be, for example, it's enough if they stay in a five-star hotel for a couple of months, but the exclusion really um, means that they have to disappear as if they would not exist for a certain uh, period of time. In the meantime, the celebrities uh, demonstrate the transformation they underwent thanks to the scandal. So they undergo hospitalization, they divorce from partners, they withdraw from social life, you name it. And this exclusion aims at securing economic capital, basically, because the Jimusho, the talent agency, kicks out the transgressing celebrity and becomes purified in the eyes of the advertisers. That's why always immediately after a scandal the celebrities kick out from the agency. As for the politicians, the exclusion works there as well. The politicians are strategically excluded. Some politicians, such as Ozawa Ichiro, excludes himself uh, to prevent failure in upcoming elections. They resign from the party or parliament, they promote to protect the party, but they usually keep on pulling strings behind the scenes. 
Now, when you talk about ritual, we need to talk about scapegoating as well, which is a ritual that was present in Kamelo existence since ancient times in both um, tra uh, traditional Greek life and uh, Japanese life. The group uses scapegoats as bad apples or rotten apples in order to protect itself. So, in Japanese scandal, the usual scapegoats are the secretaries. That's the most typical scapegoats. They work, or Hisho, secretary Hisho. Hisho work as protective shields against accusation, because, and they secure the political standing of their bosses. Ozawa Ichiro um, uh, survived his scandal partly because he said, Hisho ni makaseta, I left the matter up to my secretary. And the secretaries got suspended sentences, they said they had nothing to do with it, and the ritual goes on. And the most serious form, form of exclusion is the so-called scapegoat suicide. Uh, you can relate it to inseki jisatsu, uh, jisatsu or responsibility to suicide. What does it mean? It is the case that in Japan it is the secretaries, bureaucrats, officials, that actually end their life as a means of taking responsibility for scandal. Now, uh, some secretaries can uh, perceive the sacrifice, their own sacrifice, as a duty to divert responsibility from their bosses. Because suicide usually stops prosecution. So if you kill yourself, you kill the scandal. And some, and not some, very, quite many people, more than 20 political secretaries kill themselves uh, in the wake of a scandal between 1945 and 1989, but I did some more research and I realized that the scapegoat suicide is, uh, is going on uh, just like this. So there are many cases of scapegoat suicide. Uh, there are even scandals that produce multiple suicide, which was the case of the Lockheed scandal from 1976. Three people died. And finally, this is the last stage, reintegration. So we had confession, then exclusion, and then reintegration. It is the case that the ritual of exclusion and the shaming process looks really damning for one's career. It looks like it destroys, it must destroy your career if you are uh, crying <coughs> on the telly and, you know. But we talk about restorative justice, not retributive justice. So, here we talk about the return to society by behavioral correction instead of mere punishment. That's why the focus on scandalization in Japan is on reintegration rather than retribution. So, in reality, the elites avoid direct punishment, for example, because they use their secretaries. They get maybe suspended sentence, which is pretty much the maximum they can get. They can be parachuted to less visible ranks after scandal or in the And they apologize and return to their post as a completion of the purification ritual or misogy. So you can see that the reintegration is quite smooth in case of politicians. Moreover, the majority of politicians, both for prime ministers and the big ones, actually had their scandal pending, like huge scandal. But they all became more powerful after the scandal. Many of them actually <coughs> became prime ministers. They were quick, quickly reintegrated and they were back in the system. You can see, you know, including Tanaka Kakue, Fukuratake, Ikeda Hayato, Sato Esaku, they all had huge scandal spending, Showa Denko scandal, shipbuilding scandal. They all became prime ministers. It almost looks like it's, it's a good thing to have a scandal when you are a politician in Japan because it somehow makes you more powerful and maybe fearful. But this is really the case. So the reintegration is quite smooth in Japanese politics. What about the celebrities? The male celebrities, they get away with scandals easily, rather easily. Consider only people like Shimizu Kentaro or Tashiro Masashi or well, that's enough. They had multiple scandals, and I'm talking about five, six, seven scandals. They always you know, apologize in tears and they made a comeback after some time. They sort of abused the scandal ritual because they, was they were constantly taking drugs. But they knew that actually they only need to do the purification ritual and they will be maybe reintegrated, which was the case. Other celebrities such as Shinzu Ken, uh, such as Inagaki Goro, who had a hit and run traffic accident, that's the guy from SMAP, uh, there was a terrible scandal and he made a comeback in five months time only. 
Oshio Manabu <coughs> had a drug scandal pending, another celebrity. But his transgression was serious. He took drugs with a hostess, and the hostess died. So that was really a proper scandal. But even here, Oshio Manabu was exiled and reintegrated. It only took five years' time. So you see, if the transgression is really serious, such as somebody dies, then it can take up to a year's time to be reintegrated again. But the integration <coughs> is there almost always. As for the female celebrities, again, the shaming, the public shaming goes into extremes. They are crying, people are angry, it's really <coughs> uh, like a disaster. But even here, the females are later allowed to proceed with their career, as if, no, as if nothing happened. You know, just take Becky, if you remember Becky. She had a dating scandal. You know that these celebrities cannot really date because that's, uh, that's seen as a bad thing from, uh, by the hardcore royal fans. So the celebrities should be sort of virginal and pure and for everybody. But Becky was dating someone, it became a scandal. But a huge scandal. It was a craziness, like months time. But guess what? She was back in six months. She apologized again as a completion of the ritual, and she was just back to the system, so nothing really happened. Now, I, taught, I talked about three strategies in scandal. Uh, the apologetic, the defensive, the offensive. And there is one more case which I call Sendiraku Hapan or strategy collapse. When the whole thing collapses into something which is unheard of. So, uh, perhaps the most infamous scandal is that of Nonomura Ryutaro in this regard, who actually fails to explain his transgression when he was talking to the journalists. He struggled to express regret. He was not really looking sad. He verbally attacked the journalists. This is the offensive strategy, which can be used only by the experienced ones, not some other provincial. And he finally collapsed in a hysterical tantrum. Watch the YouTube video and try not to laugh. So <laughs> this was really a spectacle of suffering, as Luke Boltanski would say. This was a spectacle of suffering. But guess what? If you do something like this, if your strategy collapses, the system will not reintegrate you. That's the only case where the reintegration is not possible. So Nanomura Rudaro, he ended up as a jobless recluse and a pariah in his community. He's only doing some um, private radio station or whatever. But you know, if you if you sort of uh, misperform or overperform, it becomes hazukashi. In other words, so many Japanese respondents I discussed this with said the only feeling they felt was hazukashi, because this kind of became a viral and uh, you know online big thing. And this is when the Japanese feel like, oh, this is really a shame, you know, hazukashi. They don't do, it looks like this is a typical Japanese politician reacting to scandal, but that's not really the case. One more a case of rather overperformance than strategy collapse was that of Min uh, Minagishi Minami in 2013. Uh, she had a dating or sex scandal, she was dating someone. She spent a night uh, in a love hotel with another member of a celebrity band. And that's her reaction. She shaved her head, she cried. Uh, crazily for hours, uh, for minutes time. She confessed in tears, that was important. She admitted to her transgression, referring to that guy. She expressed deep remorse and she even self-stigmatized herself uh, as a form of sort of atonement. She did it you know, spontaneously. This was, usually scandals are not spontaneous, but this one was very really spontaneous. She really believed that she did something bad. She didn't perform like the majority of other celebrities. She was really herself. And that saved her uh, professional life because uh, she gained some public sympathy because of that. She shocked the foreign observers, but in Japan she was like, okay, it was a little bit too much, but you, you did a good job. And she made a very quick comeback uh, in months' time. So you can see that in this case the reintegration is possible. There are, however, cases where it doesn't work. And this is my sort of conclusion of the second part of my speech. So we have the sacred and profane realm. Now, uh, the transgressor departs from the sacred realm, the transgressing person, and has to confess <coughs> in the media. Only then is he or she excluded to the profane realm, 
uh, or to the social exile, which is, in my uh, uh, opinion, uh, corresponding with Murachibu. And after spending <coughs> months or years time, depending on the gravity of the transgression, the person is reintegrated again to the Uchi Naibu, the sacred, the good society. And this is all from my side. I would like to thank you very much for your attention and arigatou gozaimasu.